In this lecture, we're going to look at the judicial branch in a bit more detail. We already went through the executive branch, we went through the legislative branch. It's time to look at the courts. Now, why is law so important? There is no such thing as a society without laws. You may have a bunch of people interacting without laws, but if that interaction becomes regular and lasts for a while, rules will arise for guiding it. Rules usually begin as non-written social mores. If those mores and patterns of behavior survive the test of time, they become customary law. Customary law, when put in writing, becomes what we nowadays call law. The closest we have to a collection of polities interacting without law is the international system. And simply, even that has laws, especially customary laws. From our laws about how ambassadors are supposed to be treated, to laws about which countries can claim a product as a trademark. Indeed, the only places where you can find instances of pre-law social relations are first contacts between different civilizations. For example, Europe and the Mesoamerican cultures, or the Mongols and Islam. None of these first contacts were nice. Law thus arises in all social systems, in all cases of regular long-term interaction. And it, they do because laws provide some important goods. They provide security, provide predictability, courts as a method of conflict resolution, laws can reflect and enforce societal values, and they can distribute goods and allocate costs in the who gets what, when, where, and how of politics. A key part of the development uh, of a society in complexity is when laws uh, and the legal system for adjudicating them replace dueling as a way of resolving differences in a society. Ah, right through me! Prepare for returned fire, Sir Joseph Broadfront! I give you one last chance to rescind your insult of calling me a common dandy. Never! But as I said, laws are also about essentially uh, uh, representing certain social and cultural norms or prejudices and enforcing them. And for example, here in the United States of America, we can see this in the diversity of the laws at which age it is legal to have sex. What's the age of consent? And some states say the age of consent is 16, including Nevada. Some states say the age of consent is 18. Some states say that the age of consent is 17. That differentiates from country to country due to different views about cultural norms and when does adulthood in some of these questions become important. If you have ever thought about why you should care about history, especially ancient and medieval, here is a reason. The principles by which our legal system operates is heavily influenced by history. Indeed, the actions of people alive 1,000, even 2,000 years ago reverberate in your lives today. Broadly speaking, the two dominant legal systems in the Western, in quotation marks, world are the civil law and common law tradition. The civil law tradition comes to us from ancient Rome. In the Roman Republic, there were two sets of laws, the customary family law that applied to private matters and the more official and written civil law that applied to public matters. The civil law laid down the authority of the Senate and was codified. This tradition continues to modern times through the Napoleonic Code and is the system of law of most European countries and their colonies. This is because most European countries were either parts of the Roman Empire or Napoleonic Empire. In the US, Louisiana, the state had a civil law tradition as it was part of the French Empire. The other great tradition is the common law tradition. This comes from the legal traditions of the Germanic people which broke Roman power. In common law tradition, Law includes the decisions of kings, assemblies of free men, and more importantly, the past decisions of judges. It includes far more customary law than does the civil law tradition. American legal tradition is more influenced by Anglo-Saxon common law as developed over the long history of the British Isles rather than the civil law tradition. Through, in the logic of the civil law tradition, most laws in America are written down and codified. Now, the principles of the common law tradition are this, uh, and they provide judges with immense power. Judges, not executives or legislators, uh, uh, interpret the law. Then there is the stare decisis, precedent, uh, that means past laws must be preserved. 
And finally, the judge uh, is seen as a referee, not an inquisitor. Uh, what this means is they can literally make laws as any decision they make becomes part of the legal system without the need of parliament to explicitly vote in the decision. This power through is checked by the need of judges to respect the integrity of the legal system. If individual judges did as they wished, will they nearly newly find past decisions in each other's rulings, in due time the common law system would fail the predictability and security tests and will be abandoned for a civil law system. Judges thus have a cynical incentive to follow precedent. It creates a predictability that underpins the legal system. Uh, this also holds in questions when there are nullifying past decisions, for example, like the recent uh, Supreme Court decision that nullified Roe versus Wade. They have to base those nullification on other previous decisions or general common law principles, or in the dissenting opinions of judges in those decisions. As we're going to see later on, that's the role of dissenting opinions, providing future courts a common law compliant way of uh, taking away previous decisions. Finally, it means that US judges are not in the job of seeking the truth. They are not inquisitors trying to uncover who did what. Their role in a trial is to make sure due process is followed and that the law is obeyed, not to prove or unprove a point. They have, if you will, a less flashy role within a trial than European judges, but more impact long term. The other thing about the US uh, judicial system is that it's an adversarial system. Winning equals with being right. In Germany, for example, you have an inquisitorial system where the goal of the court is to find out the truth of what happened. It does not assume just because you won the trial that that was the truth of it. Uh, and that's because judges in Germany have the rights to ask questions, to call witnesses, demand more evidence, while judges in the United States of America are main referees between uh, two adversaries, whether that is the state and a person or two persons. And we love to sue in America. The only other place in the world where I've seen people as willing to sue as in America is in Turkey. We love to sue and we solve our problems by suing each other rather than beating each other, which is something that uh, some barbarian aliens find hard to understand. <laughs> That's not right. idea what these cars are worth? 30,000 bucks. You got any idea what we're gonna do to you if we find one itty bitty scratch on them? Any idea? Let me guess. You're gonna pound my face, break every bone in my body, then you're gonna drag me across the gravel road and feed my remains to a warthog. Is that about right? What are you, nuts? This is the 90s. We're gonna sue you. We're gonna get you for willful destruction of property. Yeah. Mental anguish. That's giving it to them. Loss of work hours. We get through with you, you ain't gonna have a dime left of your name. You'll be hearing from our attorney. What kind of world is this? How much? We have 40 civil lawsuits per 1,000 people. That is much higher than anywhere else in the world. Now, this makes the American judicial system very litigious. However, this is because a lot less of our everyday lives are regulated by state laws, creating a common principle on which to resolve differences. Thus, many times we need to resolve our differences without law. This is where civil courts comes in. Here's the important part. Essentially, government courts do two things. They adjudicate differences between society as represented by the state and individuals, in which case we really are talking about criminal cases. And they adjudicate, adjudicate differences between individuals and individuals, or subgroups of society and subgroups of society. In those cases, we are talking about civil suits. Now, for a government to make sense, it must have the monopoly of criminal court. You can only have criminal cases done by the government. No other systems, no other courts, no mediators, and so on. 
think of how hard it will be for the U.S. government to work if every convicted murderer in the U.S. could go and have a new trial in Spain, the result of which could be upturned by a new trial in China, etc. Why would you obey such a government or be willing to pay taxes to it? More importantly, why would you rely on law? to find redress in such situations. In due time, it will fall back to pre-legal systems or resolving such differences, which could be as peaceful as anarchists and libertarians claim, or could be very nasty and violent as history tends to indicate. However, the government need not hold a monopoly when it comes to civil law. People could decide to resolve their personal differences in court through arbitration by a different third party than court, or through other methods, including crimes. Indeed, corporations and uh, states many times make our agreements to resolve any differences that arise from a contract, not through state courts, but through independent for-profit arbitration agencies. When it comes to civil cases, the state court is one of many options. Indeed, television series like People's Court are actually private arbitration agencies. People make a contract agreement with that arbitration the agency to have the judge arbitrator difference, and that is actually uh, legally binding. Uh, so, and you get to watch it on TV. That is literally an arbitration agency. When legal disputes threaten the People's Court peacekeeping mobile, zooms into action. You two seem to be at loggerheads. He parked on my petunias. Don't take the law into your own hands. Take a break and watch the People's Court. Ah! Who was that man in the blue blazer? Come home to the best. The People's Court, weekdays at 5, only on TV 11. Now, what kind of laws do these uh, courts adjudicate? We have substantive laws, like criminal law, which tell us what we can do and cannot do. Then we have procedural laws, like the Miranda right. You have the right to remain silent, etc. Which is, how are we going to decide if a substantive law is in breach? Uh, and it comes from the procedural due process clause of the Constitution. Then we have criminal law, acts that are seen as acts against the state and the society it represents, which is a form of substantive law. Then we have civil war, so-called tort, which is about how we resolve our personal differences when it covers acts that are not considered by the state and society as uh, being against them. And then we have constitutional law, what the Constitution says and what have judges said about the Constitution. Most laws are statutory laws, the laws passed by legislators. We also have administrative law, which is created by government bureaucracies, for example, the rules concerning promotion in the military. And finally, we have executive orders. Now, an important thing to understand about laws in the American system is that the Supreme Court has claimed for itself the power of judicial review, which gives it the power to decide whether any of the laws noted above is unconstitutional. Now, as in many things in the new constitution, the creation of a Supreme Court made the anti-federalists cry tyranny, which made Alexander Hamilton write one more of his little papers telling people not to worry. Oof, come now, my fellow Americans, the Supreme Court will be more boring than good old uh, John Adams as vice president. The fact that in the end, the constitution does nothing more than say there will be a Supreme Court, whose members will be selected thus and be paid thus, and they can hear these cases as original and these as appellate, sold it to people. And initially, it seemed that this will be the way things are going to be. Indeed, many of the people President Washington wanted to be Supreme Court justices simply refused. Too boring. All this changed because of a non-legal scholar in the court, John Marshall, in an important case called Marbury v. Madison, 1803, over recess appointments by President Adams, Marshall's court established the principle of judicial review, that the courts could determine whether a law was constitutional. Now, this is not something totally new. England had a similar principle. However, because in England, Parliament is the Supreme Court of the land, there is a big difference. What is it? Well, in England, the supreme power to consider a law constitutional is held by the representatives of the people. Parliament is voted by the people. In the United States of America, the supreme power to decide the constitutionality of a law is held by an unelected office, which is appointed by the president in, uh, with the consent and advice of the Senate. So it's essentially an agent of an agent of the principle, rather than a directly an agent of the principle. Some have considered this anti-democratic, others are happy that there is a Supreme Court that can protect Americans from each other. It's up to you and what kind of a country you want. I got no good answers about this. 
Now, the U.S. court system, due to the principle of federalism, which we'll cover in another lecture, is a dual system. We have a total of 50 state courts and a federal court system. Which cases go to which court depends on whether the case falls within the jurisdiction of one or the other court system. Courts can have original jurisdiction, and another name that is the first trial to determine the facts of substantive law are decided there. For criminal case, this means trial by jury. For civil court cases, it means either trial by jury or trial by judges. It changes from system to system. Courts can also have appellate jurisdiction. In this case, usually the losers of the trial court appeal the decision on procedural grounds. That is, they claim the law was not applied properly. Appellate courts only determine the procedural aspect and do not question the decision about what is true from the trial court. All appellate courts are trial by judges. How do we decide jurisdiction? Well, it based on what the Constitution says, what does the statutory law say. For civil cases, is there a private agreement that says a difference will be taken to a specific court? And the characteristics of the case, is the federal government involved? A state government's involved. Where did the case arise? How serious is the offense? When it comes to appeal courts, the Supreme Court gets most of its cases from this procedure as it's as the highest appellate court in both the state and the federal system. And it's at the distraction of the court to hear cases. They don't have to hear cases. They can choose which cases to hear and they can dismiss other ones. So you are not guaranteed an appeal okay, by the Constitution. Now, the state court system is made of 50 systems. Every state has its own state court system. Each made is, it is made up of trial courts, some kind of appeal court, three-fourths of the cases, and a state supreme court. Uh, some states might not have appeal courts, and just trial courts and the supreme court that acts as the appeal courts. Judges are elected in many of them, either by the people or by the legislature, while in others, they are appointed just as in the federal case. Let's take a deeper look at the Nevada court system. Now, the Nevada court system is made up of the Nevada Supreme Court. Originally, it had three members, now seven members. And this court is the Supreme Court of Nevada. It's the highest court. It has both original and appellate jurisdiction. So most of its cases come through appellate jurisdiction. And if a case does not involve a federal statute or some element of the United States Constitution, this is the final court in the Nevada court system. Now, because the Nevada Supreme Court historically was overwhelmed by the number of cases being sent to it for appeals uh, due to the increasing population of the state, in 2014, finally, after about a decade of attempts, the voters uh, accepted an amendment to the Constitution that created the Nevada Court of Appeals. This has three members and it receives all its cases from the Supreme Court. So it doesn't actually choose itself what appeal cases to hear, but the Supreme Court gets appeal cases from the lower courts and then assigns some of them to the Nevada Court of Appeals. Both courts, when they're operating as appeal courts, uh, do not hear uh, facts. They focus on the procedure of the case and so on. Then you have the main courts with which um, people in Nevada have to interact, and those are the Nevada District Courts. There are 11 districts with about 82 judges in total working with them. And these are the courts you mostly will interact with if you've got problems with the law and issues. Uh, they take care of all the serious uh, crimes and issues and civil cases, and they also include the family court system and about 22 other special courts. Finally, you have municipal and justice courts, justice of the peace courts. These primarily deal with petty crimes, petty issues, and petty civil court issues, the level of either the municipality or the county system. Now, Russia, like many other states in Nevada, most of the judges are elected. The Supreme Court and Appeal Court judges are elected for six-year terms that are staggered, but not in the case of the Appeal Court, where the three judges are elected at the same time and have to be elected at the same time. You must be 25 years of age, you must be an elector, have the right to vote in the state, and you must be an attorney licensed to practice in Nevada and a resident for two years. And there are 50 years of legal practice experience required, at least of two of which were in Nevada. District court judges have exactly the same requirements, but they only need 10 years of legal practice experience, and they're not uh, necessarily staggered. But they are. They are staggered. Yes.
Judges of the peace are elected for six years staggered terms, must have a high school diploma and be electors, and depending on uh, the region, they might have to be an attorney for five years or not. It depends on the region. Municipal court members are either elected for four-year terms or appointed, serving at the pleasure of city councils. They must be residents of the city for a year. Uh, elect of the, they must be residents of the state, electors, and have resided in the city for one year. There are debates about whether election or appointment is better for the quality of justice. Election provides democratic accountability for justices. Uh, on the other hand, it also means that they can be corrupted uh, by uh, the electoral process, as in the case of the two judges in the story that's embedded in this PowerPoint. Appointment, on the other hand, might uh, protect from corruption in that sense, but on the other hand, makes judges more likely to be beholden to the executive branch, thus violating separation of powers. What's the right answer, the wrong answer? Again, there's no clear answer. You have to decide on your own. Well, let's do this story then, because in this one, it is, in fact, about the money. Show me the video if you can, Dan. These are two elected officials in Pennsylvania. They're pleading guilty, get this, to taking kickbacks in exchange for throwing teenagers in jail. How's it work? Well, meet Judge Mark Chavarella and Judge Michael Conohan. They pocketed $2.6 million from private youth detention centers who had to keep a very high headcount in order to keep their government contract. And that's why the judges were sending kids to their jails who may not necessarily have needed to be in jail. Elections have created problems in Nevada as well. From 1984 to 1995, there was a crisis of the upper excellence of the justice system in Nevada, which made... Funnily enough, justice is probably less popular than the legislature, something that's not the case at the federal level. There were nasty and expensive election campaigns between opposed justices. There was a lot of intra-court fighting with justices in the Supreme Court turning against other justices in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was seen as protecting corrupt lower court justices, and the judges were also accused of trying to uh, increased their pay uh, while they were in term, which is actually illegal under the Constitution. Uh, in an attempt to fix the face of the Supreme Court and of the justice system, the Supreme Court made some, more, uh, some measures to increase transparency, creating meetings open to the public, public uh, making uh, civil records public, making the records of the judicial committee, as we're going to learn, public when a judge is accused and so on. But there's still problems. Because of the issues that can arise from an elected electorate, there are a couple of checks and balances to elected judges in Nevada. There's a commission of judicial discipline created since 1976, whose members are appointed by the Supreme Court, the Bar of Nevada and the governor, and whose job is to essentially control the judges uh, and even has the power of censuring, firing them, and so on, and removing them. Originally, judges were also under the recall options, but in 2017, a decision of the Nevada Supreme Court removed that option from the citizens by saying that judges are not public servants, thus not under the recall option. Take whatever you want from that. They can be impeached if they're higher court justices, that means Supreme Court, Appeals Court, and District Court justices by the legislature. And finally, and it's not very clear, perhaps the legislature can just remove them without having to go through the impeachment process. But these are supposed to be checks and balances against the possibility of elected judges not doing their job because they're trying to serve other interests. Now, when it comes to the federal court system, it is the creation of Congress, and nowadays it's made up of 94 U.S. federal district courts, with the United States being divided into 12 U.S. Court of Appeals plus one more for patents. Uh, so there's this huge division of the United States. Each Court of Appeal has a specific district of the United States that it covers, and one Supreme Court. Federal judges are appointed by the President with the consent of the Senate. President have thus the power to make the federal court system more representative than the legislature on some issues, for example, gender and race, but it is usually harder to make it in others, for example, for example, education and wealth. Most federal judges are well off and highly educated. 
Senatorial courtesy tends to guide who becomes a judge at the district level, but not at the appellate or Supreme Court level. There, the uh, president usually is able to get what he wants. Senatorial courtesy means that, for example, getting the appointing a federal judge at the district court that covers Nevada, he will usually listen to the what the two senators from Nevada want, and so on. Now, when it comes to choosing federal judges, uh, there are essentially two main ways in which uh, the presidency and the Senate has chosen them. One is the body system in which friends of friends or people within the network, the personal network of senators or the president is chosen, uh, usually as a kind of reward or to make sure that the president has a sympathetic court uh, supporting uh, their policy. Now, the other way is meritocracy, based essentially on legal scholar credentials, publications, success in the court systems, and so on. Over the last years, it has become more and more ideological. Uh, in the history of the... Now, remember, federal judges serve for life, and they can be impeached. In the history of the Republic, only 14 federal judges have been impeached. That means judges outside of the Supreme Court, uh, you know, district uh, judges and appellate judges. Now, when it comes to the Supreme Court, it gets the highest ratings from the public than either the presidency or Congress. We, the people, with a capital P, tend to think of our Supreme Justice as above the dirt of politics. But that's our view will be highly naive. The Supreme Court is a deeply political institution whose decisions have huge impact on each part of who gets what when and where and how of politics. And by the way, the image you see there is the only way you can see the Supreme Court, except if you're actually visiting there. It's, it's prohibited to actually video the Supreme Court when it's in meeting. You can only, you can only have watercolor paintings and uh, caricatures. And then let's consider impact in the who, the Dred Scott case, impact in the what, Obamacare by including uh, previously categories of commerce that were outside the government point, impacting the how the Miranda rights. And I didn't need to tell you about uh, the Roe versus Wade and the uh, repeal of that decision, how it affects the who, what, and how. So the Supreme Court has immense power in American politics. So how are these powerful individuals chosen? Well, not that differently from the other federal judges, with a big difference that the president plays a bigger role and makes a conscious attempt to gain a political advantage. This includes uh, merit as a way to decide, shared political or judicial ideology, a way to decide uh, using the Supreme Court as a political reward or using it to make more demographic representation. Keep in mind, by the way, that you're not, you don't need to be a lawyer to become a Supreme Court judge. Technically speaking, the Constitution has no such stipulation. Anybody could be a Supreme Court judge. And in the past, non-legal scholars have been Supreme Court judges, including John Marshall and uh, even President Taft, after he stopped being president, was made a Supreme Court judge. So anybody could become a Supreme Court judge. There's not even an age limit. If you ever become president, you, you have fun with that, okay? You have fun with that. Let's see how the country reacts. When we meet about political ideology in the case of Supreme Court justices, sometimes it's not about whether they're Republicans or Democrats, but whether they agree with strict, strict constructionism or judicial interpretivism, which are two different legal uh, theories with strict constructionism, uh, arguing for a uh, very careful following of stare decisis and the wording of the law, while judicial interpretism argues for a more looser view of uh, understanding laws by essentially understanding how they would work in different social contexts. And they're also chosen for their wit. I want them to be funny, at least, in a way, like in this cartoon, in this video section. Finally, at a congressional hearing today, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy was asked about the Supreme Court's gift shop. And he told the story of what happened when he was going to China and was going to meet a Chinese vice premier, and he needed to have a gift to give him because an exchange of gifts is customary at such meetings. He picked out what he thought would be the perfect gift. I went down to the Supreme Court gift shop, and we had a, 
a calendar, one page for every day, 365 days a year, leather bound book. I think it cost $17, so I got that. And uh, every, every uh, day I had something of important for the Supreme Court or the American uh, Constitution, July 4th, May 17, Brown versus Board of Education. So at the dinner, he gave me the bowl, and I thanked him, and then I gave him this, and he was fascinated, and he looked at it, and I said, well, now, when's your birthday? And he said, April 17th. I said, well, now, read April 17th, and the interpreter kind of hesitated. I said, no, no, I said, April 17th, the Supreme Court of the United States decides United States versus Dennis affirming prison terms for five communist leaders of America. <laughs> And that special report for this time. Please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned for news. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. Trying to gain a political advantage over the court has been taken to its most extremes by Frederick, uh, by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who attempted to pack the court. You see, the Constitution does not say how many Supreme Court justices need to be there. You could technically have as many as you want. You could turn the Supreme Court into an actually popular assembly by, you know, assigning 10,000 citizens you choose by sortition as the president. All you need to do is have the Senate uh, agree to that. So sometimes when a president has a problem with a recalcitrant Supreme Court, they might try to pack it, which means adding new members to the Supreme Court beyond uh, the current one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so to get a majority that is on your side. Uh, but Americans have disagreed with this, even the supporters of Roosevelt disagreed with this. There were now some discussions about packing the court by the Democrats. That's not going to happen. But constitutionally, there's no limit to that. And if you want to ever democratize American politics in truth, Perhaps the one institution that could easily, legally, as long as you got the Senate supporting you, be turned into a true democratic institution, would be the Supreme Court. You just choose by sortition, 1,000 or 2,000 citizens. The Senate accepts them, and then those citizens chosen among us by sortition get to choose the constitutionality of laws. Maybe we put some term limits as well. Just saying. Now, how does the Supreme Court chooses to hear cases? Well, first of all, what happens is people who are, want a case to be heard by the Supreme Court write writs of certiorari, uh, where they explain why uh, the court should hear uh, the case. Those writs of certiorari are then uh, looked at the law clerks. The law clerks are recent law school graduates who work essentially as the readers for the Supreme Court justices. They do all the heavy reading, summarizing the petitions for the justices and recommending denial or approval. Once the clerks have read and reread the petitions and exchanged comments, the justices read the reports and make a decision. If four justices support hearing for a petition, then the petition is heard. So you only need a minority of justices to say, let's hear this case for it to be heard. And that is supposed to be a protection against the power of the majority. Reads uh, of certoriari follow strict forms and language. Uh, they must make clear that the question is about a controversy within the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and not something that would consider as a political question by the justices. Uh, if you are poor and you cannot afford legal services, there's also a form of pauperis that simplifies this for poor citizens who are seeking justice from the Supreme Court. What else plays a role? Well, appeals by the federal government through the Solicitor General of the United States of America tends to lead to the court to accept it to hear a case. Well, uh, you can also have amicus curiae briefs, which are uh, sent to support writs of certoriari, so documents presenting reasons various groups and individuals believe the court should hear a case, even through those groups and individuals are not directly involved in the case as, uh, upon, as, as judicial adversaries. Now, how does the court decide? Well, a big part of the decision is influenced by the balance between judicial activism and judicial restraint in the ideology of the Supreme Court justices. They tend not to like going against public opinion, despite whatever they say. So they usually try not to 
take on very powerful public, public opinion. They usually do not make decisions that will anger stable and strong majorities. Uh, they might be influenced and leveraged by the president, uh, and they might be influenced and leveraged by interest groups, and finally by the intergroup dynamics within the court. You know, if there are any big rivalries, dislikes, or everybody has a collegiate uh, view. Now, a decision of the Supreme Court includes three things. The opinion. Who write it is a big deal. It's decided by the Chief Justice, and it's important because this forms the basis of started decisions. This is the opinion, is the, the, the previous court decision that future court decisions have to respect. Then you have concurrent opinions, which are people who agree on with the opinion, but for different reasons. This is useful because it provides a bit more of a broader basis uh, for stare decisis, and finally the dissenting opinions, which are the minority opinions, which are the ones who disagree. This is important because if the Supreme Court or a court in the future decides to upturn this decision, they will try to do it on the basis of the dissenting opinions, okay, in order to continue keeping the stare decisis principle working. Uh, by the way, only one Supreme Court judge has ever been impeached, and that is Samuel Chase. So they tend to serve for life or they retire, which is very rare. That is how the, the court judicial system works in America. There are other issues with it. Yes, one of the biggest issue is the idea of equal treatment by the criminal justice system. Many Americans, especially African Americans, believe that the justice system is unfair to them. Um, you can see an old uh, poll, it hasn't changed much. So many other Americans consider that it works, but the point is there's a big disagreement here. And there are some indicators that some things are not right. For example, imprisonment rates by race per 100,000 residents of each group. African Americans are vastly much more often imprisoned than any other group, including Hispanics, whites, and so on. Uh, that also holds for uh, that also holds a bit for females, but not as bad, but it's really bad with African Americans. And this has led to many to accuse the court system of uh, essentially being harsher to African Americans uh, than other groups, or that African Americans face social conditions that tend to lead them to have more often brushes with the laws in a system that tends to want to punish more extremely people who are repeat offenders and thus leads to a huge population that is in prison. So many say there is a prison industrial complex built on the back of African Americans that makes money out of essentially imprisoned black bodies. And there's a lot of uh, writings and arguments about this and there's no question that in some places this is definitely the case. On the other hand, others argue that African Americans are uh, parties to more violent crimes than whites. And most of those violent crimes are actually uh, African Americans against African Americans, uh, rather than African Americans and whites, despite what the popular racist tropes say. And the high imprisonment rates simply uh, represent this. But the thing is still that a rural white will probably get a lesser punishment by a court than an urban black. And that is the reality of it. This might be due to racism, which means that the legal system itself is racist in various ways. This might be due to racial prejudice. Uh, so the system itself is not racist, but there's so much racial prejudice in the economic system, social system, that it fosters a system where essentially African-Americans get the short end of the stick, uh, or might just be bad luck. Again, there's no clear answer to this. I have my own views. You will have your own views. But let's be clear, there probably is some problem, whether this is a problem of the whole system, specific locales or specific elements within the judicial system, that's a different question. Where there is no question that there is a problem is the civil court system. You see, the civil court system 
There are no rules for it in the Constitution, very few. There are none of the guarantees. You don't have the right to a lawyer in the civil, for civil courts. There's no public defense. So money talks here even much more than the criminal court system. Those who have money get justice. With no public defenders, it means many poor people have no choice but to accept an unjust result and never get compensation for something done wrong to them. There are options, but for many poor people of all races and genders, this means that they have to accept a personal injustice because they simply cannot afford to use the civil court system. So the civil court system, we definitely have a system that is very problematic where the poor, and since most poor in this country tend to belong proportionally to minorities, and the minorities do not have access to justice that the middle class or the rich have. That's it. That's the discussion we had of the judiciary.